Hi, my name is Sam Bach, and I'm here with Joanna Sampson to do an oral history interview for the City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks Department and the Maria Roberts Oral History Program. Um, we're going to be focusing mainly today on Joanna's life and her life in Boulder. We're also going to be talking about the research she did into the Marshall Mesa coal mines and, in, and her involvement in the City of Boulder's Open Space and Mountain Parks findings, founding. So, without any further ado, uh, we will begin the interview. All right, so Mrs. Sampson, I was hoping we could start out by uh, having you tell us a little bit about where you were born, where you grew up, and what that was like. All right, I was born in Winter, South Dakota. My father was a missionary preacher and did circuit rides in Canada before he moved uh, to the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And uh, that's where I was born in Winter, South Dakota. Uh, and uh, my father then moved to um, Ankeny, Iowa, was the next move he made, and took the family with him. And at that point, that was the end of his, uh, the missionary circuit riding part of his life. And as a child, we moved a number of times. Uh, and by the time I was in the sixth grade, we had moved to uh, Angley, Iowa. And uh, from there to a place close to Des Moines, Iowa. And eventually then from there, uh, because I was an asthmatic child, we moved to Colorado. And we came that summer beforehand, we moved, uh, we moved, we came to Colorado just to see whether it worked on the asthma. This was way too fast a trip. You can't really tell much at this point. But we did move to Hayden, Colorado, mm -hmm. and that's between Steamboat Springs and Craig on the Western Slope. And indeed, it did help the asthma. Uh, the, the high altitude plus the lack of a lot of common weeds right. uh, was the, the, the cure there, I think. Uh, and it always has helped me to get to a higher altitude and to get out of the weeds because I'm allergic to all the grasses and the weeds. Right. But not the spring things. I'm lucky that I'm not allergic to the trees and that sort of thing. So the moves into Colorado were sort of gradual uh, and uh, hopefully and thankfully did work for me. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did your father do in, in Hayden? He was a preacher. Still? Yeah. yeah. But it was not the same circuit riding that he had started out with in Canada. Did he have a congregation? Oh yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, he never lacked for uh, parishioners yeah. and, and congregations. And so who was around Hayden when you moved there? What in Hayden? Yeah. Hayden was kind of a wonderful place. Number one, because it was great horse country. Hmm. And uh, I've liked horses all my life. I've kept a horse most of my life. Hmm. Uh, Hayden was also very close to the old primitive kinds of moving around in Colorado. Uh, it wasn't settled as fast as the eastern slope here mm -hmm. was. Uh, the eastern slope was settled pretty rapidly w along with everything else right. in Colorado. Uh, but the western slope was not as accessible so it was slower in its uh, civilization I guess you call it. <coughs> there were uh, real live old mountain men that still lived in Aden, that I didn't realize for many, many years, but they were there. And we had a sixth grade school teacher that made us go out and talk to some of these old guys, which I always found just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, some of them had come up the cattle trails. <coughs> the old mountain men, many of them, uh, had come up the famous cattle trails behind herds of cows that were put together in Texas. This was a long haul mm -hmm. 
And of course, these guys were all horsemen. They all had uh, their strings of horses. Uh, Coke Roberts was one of the famous people who raised horses in uh, Hayden, Colorado. He had two of the foundation stallions for the quarter horse breed. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, for a horse crazy kid, it was a great place to grow up. And I did finally uh, dawn on me what kinds of guys these fellows were that had come up those cattle trails. This was enormously historic. And at sixth grade level, or eighth grade about, I can't remember which, how old I was at this point, but some of that did soak in. Some of that, I realized, uh, was kind of important stuff. And I don't ever remember that we wrote it down, and I don't think they teach much Colorado history, even today, mm -hmm. in the public schools. Uh, my feeling is that they started at about the third grade level, which is very, very much too young to do this. Uh, and then they never touch it again. And this is too bad because it's a wonderful history and it's very dramatic history. Uh, and it is a major part of Colorado. And when you're out on those trails on horseback, you have an impression that's never going to go away. You carry that in your heart for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. which I have done. So uh, this accounts for the fact that I've kept a saddle horse most of my life uh, and used him. Uh, and I've had very good luck. I've had two horses that grew to be 30 years old. Uh, they live a pretty pampered life. But uh, in comparison, of course, to what horses lived in those long ago days. But it just happened that in Hayden, Colorado, it was kind of unique because there were the horse breeds that are still important to this day, those lines in the quarter horse breed. And uh, dumb as I was and young as I was, some of that brushed off. I, I knew somewhere along the line it dawned on me that this was pretty important kind of history. And these were important kinds of people that I got to talk to. Uh, so, so do you think that's when you started being kind of interested in history and this is where I learned where the love of the land, all of the land, what's around the next corner. Mm -hmm. uh, and that w was always what happened to me. Uh, I'd start out on a little ride, but then you had to go just a little bit farther to find out what there was around the corner or down the river a little ways. And this, uh, obviously, this is where I caught it, was on horseback out on those trails, you can't really call them trails, they were just out on the land in Route County, Colorado. So so when did you leave Hayden? Uh, actually, I finished high school in Hayden and was married. And my husband was in, what in year? pardon? In what year? 1947. Oh, wow. John and I were married. And your husband's name was? John. John Sampson. And he was finishing up college on the GI Bill at this point. And so we moved to Colorado Springs. He was a Colorado College student. Uh, for We did most of his college education there in Colorado Springs at the Colorado College. And from there he got a job at Rocky Flats just out of Boulder. and. Uh, it was just shortly after the opening of Rocky Flats. I think he was the second or third year that they employed people out there. And then, of course, he had to do the uh, uh, wait to get a clearance. He had eventually he had very high clearances uh, to work out there. And that's when we moved to Boulder then. Great. And, and so, how, how does your work with the history of El Dorado and, and Marshall fit in to all of this? Well, when my son was, I, what, how old are you when you're in the first grade, 
in the second grade. Six. Six, about. I got railroaded into being a den mother yeah. for the scouts. And they always have a project every month. These kids had a project. And I had like six little boys who were local neighbors and friends in the den. And uh, one of the projects was to go around and find out what your local history was. So at that time, the public library was Carnegie Library. And that's, that was the library in Boulder, Colorado. And that's where my son Eric got his first library card. Yeah. And I went down all ready to get all the history on Marshall. Well, there wasn't any, not one word. Yeah. But at that time, Marshall had some wonderful old coal miners. And the particular one I'm talking about now is Joseph Gabriella. He was like second or third generation already in Marshall. He was a wonderful storyteller. Uh, and he was accurate because you always do a little checking. And uh, so uh, I went and talked to him. And then he would tell me to go talk to somebody else. And pretty soon I'm in Louisville. And pretty soon I'm down on the southern part of Colorado. Mm -hmm. And of course, Hayden, Colorado is great coal country. They have a better quality of coal on the western slope. It's much harder and cleaner than anything we have on the eastern slope. And so I ended up all over this state tracking down coal mine history. And of course, when you do coal mine history, pretty soon you're into labor history because you, you really can't pull them apart. They just go together. So that's how I came by uh, researching if that's the word for it, the history of Marshall through the coal mines. Could you tell us a little bit more about what Marshall was like when you started living here? When we moved here, Marshall was practically a ghost town. The little village that's there now was pretty much there. Uh, this was the ghetto of Boulder County. This was the dirty old coal miner place. No way you could get a loan from any bank in Boulder. Uh, we borrowed money from my dad to buy this place uh, because there was no other choice. Uh, right now, everybody in the world wants to live in Marshall, Colorado. Ironic. And none of us are moving out very fast. So uh, it was a good place for a kid to grow up. Uh, there was a lot of outdoor activity. Uh, kids just kind of uh, ran pretty free over these hills. They did find out very early, at a very early age that there were some open coal mines around and that there were some dangerous places in Marshall that you stayed away from. And the kids always learned this pretty rapidly. In the wintertime, you could see very obvious fires burning in the underground workings of the mines. And we had places on our hill that were burning. And on a cold winter day, there would be great clouds of steam and, 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 uh, steam and smoke coming off of those mines. And I have pretty vivid pictures of that. At night, you could go through and see the embers, the glowing embers. And uh, this is included in one of the pictures in the history that I did do for Marshall, uh, a vivid night scene that shows the burning embers down there. They weren't very far down below, and they have burned for a very long time. Over the years, they've tried to put it out many times, and it doesn't work. It just keeps burning. So uh, obviously, I've not been up there in the last few years. Uh, so I don't know for sure exactly where it's burning or how much it's burning. Uh, but it's been studied over the years by both state geologists and of course a lot of students from a CU have been out there doing temperature tests and that sort of thing on the burning coal mines because that's the one thing that catches everybody's attention. 
uh, is the fires up there. Mm -hmm. And so far as I know, they're still burning, but they're not burning as vigorously as they did years ago. Uh, but admittedly, I haven't been up there for a long time either. Mm -hmm. Um, would you talk a little bit about your neighbors and the people who were here? Well, uh, actually we have some very illustrious neighbors. Uh, I think maybe we've always had these people. Uh, the, the coal mines, the Gabriella family has been, I don't know, they must be six, seven generations of the Gabriellas and parts of that family are still living in Marshall. Uh, there, uh, there are artists that live in Marshall. Uh, there are fine musicians that live in Marshall. Uh, the second violinist from the Col uh, Colorado String Quartet grew up in the old Marshall Schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. This is Debbie Redding. She was here last week to visit. She always comes back to visit Marshall. Uh, she has hopes of one day retiring and coming back to Colorado. Uh, growing up in the schoolhouse, I think, was a wonderful experience for her. Uh, one that has branded her, too, I think, with what Marshall was and is. It is a unique place. It has a vibrant history that isn't just the coal mine history. Now it's part of the history of open space because the open space program has lasted a lot of years. As you know, mm -hmm. it's probably last, I haven't checked the figures, but it's probably lasted almost as long as the old uh, coal mining days lasted. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind that they didn't mine coal in the summertime. The coal was a poor quality coal with full of sulfur and the minute you opened it up to the air it began to t deteriorate. Yeah. So they didn't mine in the summertime. Uh, it didn't pay to stockpile that poor quality coal is what it was. However there was a, a, an effort made to put in a uh, facilities that would save the coal enough to uh, make coke out of it. This never worked. It's not good enough coal. It doesn't get hot enough. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a smelter at one time in Boulder. Uh, there were tie-ins to some famous family, the Langsford it was called Langsford at one time, Marshall was. Uh, and Langford had a, a big, well, not big by any standard we know today, but it was a, a large smelter down in the part of Marshall that is now part of just the little town. And uh, I have pictures of those foundation rocks, enormous rocks they used there. And uh, that was written up by a, uh, a man who, oh dear, I, I have to think a minute. Uh, he had married into the family. Langsford and Marshall were uh, regulated by marriage, I think, the daughter through the daughter's line. And I think that's in the booklet. Yeah. that I did. Yes. Uh, it traces that down a little bit. I didn't go to a great deal of detail on it, but uh, then there was uh, a time when Gorham owned a lot of the mines here, and that's farther east down the railroad bed, and so it was called Gorham for a while, but there was a post office at Gorham, and so that puts that on the map pretty mm -hmm. concisely. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I do have pictures of those places, which I probably should have had for this interview, but I, I didn't think to do that. So, uh, uh, but anyway, it's been Marshall, it's been Langsford, it's been Gorham. Uh, 
uh, the Gorham I know was a post office. The other two I'm not sure about. So, um, well, I mean, since you mentioned it, I think this might be an appropriate point to ask you about um, Boulder, the Open Space Department. How, how, where, how, you were you were involved in the founding of the Open Space. Well, it happened that uh, from the den days that I did with scouts, mm -hmm. I went into the uh, Boulder camera and they had the collection of photographs at that point. And uh, Laurie Paddock just brought those, they were glass plates is what they were, brought them out and laid them out on the desk for me. And I made the selection of the Marshall pictures that they had. And these were wonderful big cameras that used the glass plates and stuff. So uh, they were very good pictures. And I had the collection of Marshall photographs. So when they started putting the program together, we used to meet at a little cafe up on the hill. And uh, the blue line was already in uh, on the books. We knew about the blue line. But then there was this growing business of what do we save? Some of this should be saved. And what will it be and how will we make the decisions? And the pictures were a help on that part of the, the research. And as it turned out, we selected, I think it was six places. Marshall was one, uh, Saw Hills Pond was one, and White Rocks was one. Those are the only three that I can remember for sure. But there were six, as I recall. And then we took those to see you and gave them to professors who then turned around and had uh, teams of students take the photographs that they had in their class and go out and start some research on these places. And this is the way I remember the, all of it beginning. Now there were other forces going at that point. The Horseman's Association in Boulder County had some wonderful film of how dangerous it was to ride in Boulder alongside the roads, that we needed some trails, we needed some places set aside for all kinds of recreation, for all kinds of people to use. And, and this was always, I think, the main thrust of the early days of the open space in Boulder County. Mm -hmm. um, so could you maybe talk a little bit about um, anything that stands out for you about the campaign to begin the Green Belts for Boulder? Um, what kind of people were involved and what was the community attitude at that time? I know there was a little bit of resistance. Well, there was a lot of resistance mm -hmm. to begin with. Take it off the tax roll. My God, you didn't do that. Right. Uh, and so it was kind of a big issue about whether this was a feasible plan or not. Uh, you know, there were a lot of, of very uh, loud arguments about taking that land off as open space. I suspect you can still hear some of those arguments, but not like they were in the beginning, because I think open space has been enormously popular, and it goes to the vote of the people always. It's the tax money, it's our money that bought the open space. And I don't think you'd get very far trying to break up the open space right now. I, I just think that you put that up to vote, and that it's always, every time anything comes up to vote, they win it on the open space. So uh, the fact that it has lasted as long and as vigorously as it has, uh, has obviously done uh, is very gratifying and in some ways amazing that it's gone as long and as, in such a healthy way it's gone. Uh, I, I sometimes look at it with sheer amazement that it has uh, thrived the way it has. Yeah. So uh, it is a wonderful idea from brilliant minds. Uh, the charter is very short 
and very concise. Yeah. And every Boulder County resident ought to read that charter because it's important yeah. that we follow the guidelines of the charter. And as I say, they're simple and they're short. Uh, so it's been a very workable plan all the way. So, I mean, what do you think is changed about the way people look at the land, you know, over time with, you know, going from resistance to taxing and buying land to having it pretty much be the defining feature of living in Boulder? You know, that's yes, it is. Boulder. For me, it's what makes Boulder livable. Right. And I think that I'm a one of a majority there. Uh, you look at the trails, and, and I look out my south window at a trail day and night. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well used. Uh, the bicyclists love that trail. Yeah. Uh, and it's fun to watch them at night with their, their big lights coming up and down that hill. It's a wonder they don't all kill themselves. <laughs> but I've never seen one take a fall even over there. Uh, I think, I don't know, for a young person growing up in Boulder, they probably take it all for granted. There are all these trails and they can take their bikes out and they can have lovely rides, they can do all that. The biggest danger I see to open space is the special interests. It does belong to us. It is ours. But we could kill it very rapidly if the special interests get in there and they have to have their thing to do. This could cripple the program. Uh, actually, even the the people that we feared the most, and I'm talking about developers here, have really come around, I think, pretty much to loving open space. Because for one thing, the minute you border your properties on open space, the prices go up. And this was obvious very soon in the program. And so uh, you don't hear the realtors uh, yelling about taking it off the tax rolls and all this sort of thing. Uh, but I do think there is an inherent danger in this business of I want to do my thing, it belongs to me. Okay, that's all true, but you, you've got to accommodate the dreams and the wishes of other people and other users to keep the program healthy and viable. But at the same time, this is a program where each user is part of the history. Mm -hmm. Every time you go out on a trail, you are part of the history. And it's a strong, that? vibrant history. Do you think people realize that? In, no, in a I don't way? think. I don't think they realize that. I don't see that obvious, do you? Mm -mm. I'm wondering if you think, you know, in your experience with um, kind of changing attitudes about land and preservation, whether you think that um, helping people to understand the history of the land and, and how they fit well, into that. Well, it's the only way they're ever going to understand the workings mm -hmm. of the program and the importance of the program is through the history of what's gone before, I think. There is, a, actually, there's a global movement now that I see that it's realizing that there are some things we have to save. There are some things we have to keep clean, like our air mm -hmm. and our water, none of which are clean at these days. Uh, uh, most of our, our water, our drinking water, is one of the greatest scarcities we have on the planet right now. Uh, and we can't, we can't live forever poisoning our land and our, our water and our air, which we're doing pretty much right now. We're not so careful as we should be with these very necessary uh, things like the air we breathe. Uh, and hopefully, it's, it's, the information is going around, it, but it's slow. Hopefully we will, before it's too late, realize how precious these things are and how much of a role they play 
through open space because this is land where we do keep it pretty clean. We've got no uh, uh, air pollution. We've got no vehicles on the land. Or we've got a few uh, maintenance vehicles on the land, but we don't have highways uh, with all their smog and stuff. So uh, all I can say is that it's going to take ongoing education and uh, uh, I do have this deep wish that everybody would read the Charter and know what it stands for. It's really very simple and it's very easy to read and I think that uh, we need to understand that it takes some work. We, we can't just leave that land sit there and take care of itself because it can't do that. And so it's going to take some care and some work from all of us to see to it that that land is preserved uh, and kept clean. So you, you touched on this just a tiny bit, but um, to get you know, really specific about it, um, do you have any recommendations for the people of Boulder or the Open Space Department for the next 40 some odd years of its existence? Well. I couldn't have called it at the beginning, so I probably can't call it now. But I think that uh, the danger is when you get special interests in there mm -hmm. uh, that got to have all their bicycles have to be, have all the rules in their favor. Uh, you can't have a horse on a trail like that. Mm -hmm. or you want the bicycles off the land because the horses don't like the bicycles. A lot of horses are scared of bicycles. Uh, and you see where this goes? It goes forever. Uh, and uh, there have always been some confrontations uh, of, of uh, hikers that don't like the horses. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's never ending. You can come up with all kinds of arguments mm -hmm. against or for whichever one you are against or for. Right. Uh, but I think that for the people who work for open space, I think there are probably young people there who don't fully understand the importance of the history that they make every single day. And from where I sit, that's an important history. It's gone a lot of years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's it's uh, the program's still there. And uh, I don't ever I remember a time. I don't think that I was over at headquarters that you didn't see people coming in. They come from all over the world to see what we did to put the open space together mm -hmm. and make it work. And we've got enough years now that I think we can say it works. We just got to keep it th working. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the aim as I see it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I suppose that it seems like an everyday, just go to the work, everyday job mm -hmm. that you do uh, and you don't think much about the fact that you are part of the history. Uh, You've worked for open space. It's a job. Uh, do you think about it in terms of the history you make when you go to work? Now it's becoming my turn to be interviewed. Yeah. Um, I've worked for open space since I was 14. So All right, about good. About 10 years now. Good. Um, and in that time, the way I've understood open space has changed a lot. Um, for me, when I was 14, it was, it was not immediately obvious to me that this wasn't something that everybody had everywhere. And as my kind of world experience and breadth of knowledge has expanded, I've come to understand um, why people think that it's special, because it's, it's not a, it's, it's an incredible privilege. And, um, you know, I, I think that it's something that if, if we can just get people onto the land um, and know even one thing about it, it, it snowballs and right. it makes them care. Um, 
and, and you don't really have to do much to, to get people there. You, you really just have to put them at Chautauqua and point them at the Flatirons. Just point down the trail a yeah. little bit. Every place you go, mm -hmm. there'll be a trail that you can go down. Mm -hmm. So now your experience has, has expanded a great deal on how you feel about the open space, mm -hmm. the importance, uh, and hopefully the work you're doing right now will help further yeah. uh, the way you feel about it. And this is something that will probably be a gift you can give other people. I would hope so. Uh, I don't know whether you do programs. I don't know whether you do hikes. I don't know what kind of educational things you do. But these are important if you think about the open space in a historical mm -hmm. context, yes. Yeah. This is an early picture of the f fires in Marshall. This is the one thing that everybody remembers about the Marshall coal fields, is that there are prolific undermined coal fires that have burned for a very long time. And this one came from uh, the early 1880s and there are still fires burning up on those hills. All right, these temperatures burn pretty hot, and this is a picture I took at night on one of the holes that we could look down into. Uh, these are shallow uh, places uh, where the embers show up pretty nicely, uh, and the fires range from 100 degrees to 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. and. Uh, these have been monitored over the years by CU students and uh, people from the uh, Department of Minerals and Geology in Denver. In June of 1989, the United States Department of the Interior sent a crew to Marshall to document the fires. James B. McCardle, Mine Land Reclamation Division of Colorado, escorted the Department of the Interior experts on this tour. Helicopter pilot Jim Bowman uh, landed next to a subsidence hole on the Sampson property and had, that had been filled several years before. And you'll notice the red clay they used to fill that hole. And uh, it uh, is just to the left of the uh, helicopter that uh, when I took the picture there. That was a fairly good sized hole. You could see that it went uh, both directions. Uh, that, so there are undermined places that go beyond th this subsidence hole. So uh, a lot of these places are on the hills of Marshall because it's been extensively mined. And uh, as it turned out, it makes for a beautiful open space site, but that it's not good for malls or development or anything like that. And it's well documented now. In Marshall, the coal fires have burned since 1869, and this is all very well documented also. Uh, it is the one thing that Marshall is famous or infamous for. And if you see this winter site, uh, you can notice the clouds of steam and smoke coming up for the fires. They, re they were burning hard in those days. The building that you see in the foreground there burned down a long time ago, so there's nothing there. And we don't see these clouds of smoke and steam today like we did then. There's a, a huge smell of sulfur burning that you can see on a day like this or on a windy day. So it's still burning underground uh, in spite of all the things they've done over the years to try to put out these fires. They've never been successful at that. And so they just continue to burn up there. Cool. Well, I was going to I was going to ask you what it was like writing the histories of Marshall and your take on history and how to write it? Well, I, uh, of course I started with the kids, with their uh, dense scout movement. But then I was pretty well hooked on going ahead and finishing out 
uh, what I'd started, and that was talking to the old coal miners. And that was one of the good things I did all along, because pretty soon I was in Louisville, and then I was in the southern fields, and then I was every place and interviewing old coal miners, all of whom are dead now. So I have that unique uh, live interview stuff. Now in those days, you couldn't get away with a recorder. Uh, no way they're going to listen or going to have anything to do with one, a woman. They didn't like that much, but they really didn't like the recorder. It was like I'd put a rattlesnake down on the table in front of them. And uh, so I just wrote notes like a crazy woman. Uh, and I got a pretty good memory once I start in with a few notes and stuff. I can uh, replicate the interview pretty well. But I'm always careful with history because there are so many things you can do to distort a history. And then it's not history anymore. Uh, I always talk to the people who lived the history. I always walked the ground where the history happened. And then I did the library work with all the documents, the books, and the uh, written stuff that I could get my hands on. And so this is the way I do every history I work on. And this, I ended up traveling a lot. I spent a lot of time in different places in the state. We have a lot of coal in Colorado, and the western slope has the best coal. It's a hard coal, and it burns clean, which this coal on the eastern slope didn't, though we used the coal on the eastern slope because it was readily available. We could get to it. We had train tracks going into it, uh, and that didn't take long to happen uh, here on the eastern slope. Uh, the western slope, uh, I grew up on the western slope, so I knew some people that lived in those areas, in the coal areas, and uh, I knew where the coal sites were. So uh, I spent a lot of years tracking down old coal miners and old coal camps. Uh, some of the coal camps in the eastern, I mean in the southern part of the state, were bought up particularly by people from Texas who wanted summer homes. And they went into places like Cokedale and bought little company houses and fixed up uh, vacation homes, places that they could go to uh, when it was summer heat in Texas. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of those little towns were uh, flooded when they put a big dam in down there so that uh, they're not there anymore and I happened into a lot of those little places as they were being destroyed uh, houses that were cut in half uh, that you could see just half of a house in the open uh, and uh, I would meet up with people who went down to look at those little camps and they would stand around and talk reminiscently about the good football team that so-and-so, what year they had. Mm -hmm. uh, talked about the things that went on at the high school level. This was a meeting place. This was uh, culturally a social place. The high school, the ball games, uh, the things that involved their kids. Uh, this seems very logical to me. And uh, so I would uh, kind of stand on the fringes and listen to how they talked about the football team of 19-whatever uh, and uh, the kids that played in those games and stuff. Uh, so it was a, kind of an unusual experience, I guess. Uh, it felt pretty normal at the time. As I look back on it, I think it wasn't quite so normal because I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and got a, a glimpse of a history that was disappearing very fast and it was never going to happen again. 
So there are countless little tunnels down there where this happened. I got just a taste of a little bit of it. Uh, I'm sure that it was a pretty traumatic time for families when you have to move out of your town and your house and, and see it essentially destroyed, which was what was happening down there. Uh, I've not been back in many years, so I don't know what it looks like these days. Uh, sometimes I go back into a place that's very historic, and uh, I can't find a landmark even mm -hmm. that looks like what I remember. It's just plain gone. So what I have, some of it is pretty fragmented, and some of it is uh, very memorable, and all of it was history in its own way, and I try to be pretty respectful of that since I know that a history can be distorted so easily. Mm -hmm. And sometimes for pretty shameful reasons uh, that I would not like to be connected with. Uh, I think you have to be kind of a purist when you deal with histories like this because you're getting fragments and you're getting a, a voice gear and a place there and another voice and another incident and it's very hard to put the whole scene together and in some ways it's easy when you use the fragments all of a sudden the history is there it just comes off the page off the word it's there so uh, it's a delicate subject and it should be treated as such in my opinion uh, and I think one has to be very, very careful with the history. And this ties back into how I feel about the people who are dealing with open space today. The people that work there every day, the people that are part of the policies that are made there every day, that one has to be very careful uh, how you treat the whole subject, how you put together plans for the whole progress of the uh, open space movement itself and I think this is a big job I think it's going to take a lot of insight and it's going to take a lot of dedication and it's going to take a lot of work and I hope and I know that that open space has many employees that are truly dedicated to the concept of open space and I think we're probably safe in those hands and we should be very careful that uh, we understand that and that we uh, consider guidelines that keep the whole progress open uh, to the idea, the dream, if you will, of open space that's worked pretty well for a lot of years now. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if you would ask Joanna what you had talked about so Joanne, I wondered if you might just speak a little bit more to your specific roles in forming the Open Space Department back in 1966, 67, when you guys were trying to generate support for that tax initiative. Okay, because uh, you can turn it on. I am pretty uh, minimal, I think, as to input on uh, what we did to get the uh, Open Space accepted and get it passed, because it did come up to the vote of the people. I've done cultural meetings, slideshows, field trips. Uh, uh, Brent Wheeler and I used to do a seasonal field trip on Marshall Mesa Coal, and we would go one Saturday morning usually and guide a field trip all through the Marshall, the, the northern part of the Marshall coal field uh, and we'd have uh, a few people we didn't have huge crowds we did have some uh, pretty dedicated people that showed up to those hikes uh, we have never had a huge population of hikers that went with us uh, we did one time have 
a couple of incidences. One, there was a guy in one of the trips that I couldn't quite figure out. I wasn't sure where he was coming from, but I figured that he knew something about coal mining. And when everybody was pretty well gone, after we'd gone down to the trailhead where they, they kept a lot of the tools, coal mining tools, that they brought from the Lafayette uh, Coal Mine Museum in Lafayette. And after they'd all gone, this guy stepped up to me and he said, do you have one of these? And he handed me a check. Now this is the round uh, piece of metal that a miner had that he hooked to his coal car so they knew whose coal that was that went over the scale. And it was credited then to his account. And I know that he got them at the Columbine Mine because I had seen them over there. And he gave me a handful of them, uh, which was lovely. It's a lovely gift to have mm. somebody give you. And it had been at the Columbine Mine site. Uh, and they would hook it on the car to tell that that was his coal. He also wore one on his body because if he got killed in a mine explosion, this maybe was the only thing that identified the body. And let's see, did they hook him anyplace else? I guess that was about it. That th this is where he was, this is where his paycheck came from, actually, is when he was, when he went over the scale and they wrote it up in the ledger that this was, well, sometimes they wrote it right and sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they credited the company with more weight, and he didn't. Then took it from his actual weight, hmm. so he was getting short cut. Uh, and this was common practice. This was one of the things that the union always w was uh, concerned about: is how these cars of coal went over the the scales, because the scales were way up above. The coal miner was way down in the mine. And he didn't know, he couldn't see the scale readings. He didn't know what they were writing down. So this was a place where he got cheated very often. And this was a point of contention. This is one of the things that, that the unions was, were concerned about. It was one of the things that made the uh, coal miners very angry. I mean, if you've loaded a ton of coal in a coal car, I suspect that your knees and your back know you loaded a ton of coal but it only felt fair that the paycheck that came in was accurate, and often it wasn't. So this was a, a critical time for a coal miner, and it was also a lovely gift that I got from that man that day. Uh, one time we had the state geologist who went on that trip. I'm glad that I didn't know that that's who they were or what they were. Uh, uh, just wonderful people, actually, uh, wh who were very interested in the history of the, of the coal mining that went on here. Uh, so uh, then I've done uh, the slideshows for all kinds of people, of, and I've done them for open space mm -hmm. as part of the cultural historical cultural training that they get. Cool. Uh, so I've done that. Uh, but I think, I, I think of Mae Johnson who uh, worked with 4-H